Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if I could request the resetting of the clock, because it's on a four minutes at the moment. I presume from the one before. Fantastic. Okay, so my name's Akala. Uh, I'm from the Hip Hop Shakespeare Company. And before we get into the philosophy of, of, of our work, what that means, what the intention is behind it, I'm going to challenge you guys to a little bit of a pop quiz. And we've done this pop quiz quite a few times. We'll talk about it after we do it. I'm going to simply tell you some quotes. One-line quotes taken either from some of my favorite hip-hop songs or some of my favorite Shakespearean plays or sonnets. And you're going to tell me, by show of hands, whether you think it's hip-hop or Shakespeare. Does that make sense? Okay. So the first one we'll go for is, to destroy the beauty from which one came. To destroy the beauty from which one came. If you think that's hip-hop, raise your hands, please. If you think that's Shakespeare, raise your hands, please. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, about 70% towards Shakespeare. It's from a gentleman known as Sean Carter, better known as Jay-Z, from a track called Can I Live. We'll go for another one. Maybe it's hatred I spew. Maybe it's food for the spirit. Maybe it's hatred I spew. Maybe it's food for the spirit. Hip-hop? Shakespeare? Getting overwhelmingly towards the Shakespeare. Interesting. Anyone heard of a gentleman known as Eminem? <laughs> he is not Shakespeare. That's from a track Eminem did with Jay-Z, actually, called Renegade. We'll go for a couple more. Men would rather use their broken weapons than their bare hands. Men would rather use their broken weapons than their bare hands. Hip-hop? <clears throat> Shakespeare. Pretty even spread with a Shakespearean lean. That one is from Shakespeare. It's from a play known as a fellow. We go for, I was not born under a rhyming planet. I was not born under a rhyming planet. Hip hop? Shakespeare. That one is Shakespeare. Too much to do about nothing. We'll go for two more. We'll go for, the most benevolent king communicates through your dreams. The most benevolent king communicates through your dreams. Hip-hop? Shakespeare. About 50-50 there. Gentleman known as the RZA, who's the head of the Wu-Tang Clan. We're going to be revisiting the Wu-Tang later. We'll be talking about him a lot as one of the main exponents of, of hip-hop philosophy, someone or a collective that were a huge influence on me. But we'll revisit that. Last quote of the day. Let's go for... Socrates, philosophies, and hypotheses can't define. Socrates, philosophies, and hypotheses can't define. Hip-hop? Shakespeare. Overwhelmingly towards hip-hop on that one. That is hip-hop. That's Wu-Tang again. That's from a gentleman known as Inspector Deck. Interestingly, that quote comes from a single, a track known as Triumph, from the album Wu-Tang Forever. Wu-Tang Forever was the first hip-hop album to go number one in this country. So that was what made hip-hop crossover, was this kind of lyricism. But we're going to revisit that a little later and revisit the Wu-Tang, as I said. So, as you can see, it wasn't as clear-cut as many of us may have thought. The language used, the subject spoken about, Various things make it very, very difficult once the context is taken away, once our perception is taken away, and we have to look at just the raw language of the two, uh, two art forms. And don't worry, we've done that exercise over 400 times, and as yet, no one has got them all right. Not even some of the most senior uh, professors at some of the most respected Shakespearean institutions in the country. I shan't name names. Um, but needless to say, it's challenged a lot of people's perceptions, and we extend from there. We look at some of the other parallels between hip-hop and Shakespeare, some of the other things that they share. One of the main things that is shared between the two is, of course, rhythm. The iambic pentameter, de-dum, 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 de-dum. Five sets, two beats is actually a wonderful rhythm to use in hip-hop music and translates in a way that even artists writing today find difficult. What do I mean by that? So it's very difficult to take, even as an MC who's a professional MC, a lyric you've written over a grime beat. Grime is 140 BPM, very, very fast uh, tempo. And then take that same lyric and put it on a, what we consider to be a traditional hip-hop beat, 70, 80 BPMs. It's a very, very difficult skill, even writing now with the music to hand. 
Yet the iambic pentameter allows us to do just that. But I'll show you what I mean rather than tell you. So listen up. Cue music, please. What you're about to hear, some of you may know of it, some of you may not, is Shakespeare's most famous poem, Sonnet 18. I haven't doctored it to make it fit to the rhythm, but just listen close. Okay, yo. Shout, I compare thee to a summer's day. Thou art my lovely, you're more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaves have all too short a date. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dim. And every fair from fair sometimes declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of the fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in a shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. As men can breathe and eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. Now, now, as you can see, it sits right there in the rhythm. It's right, right in the pocket of the beat. Now, we're going to try a completely different style of beat, different tempo of beat, but you're going to see the same lyric, because of this consistent rhythm, can fit. Let's try it. Shout, I compare thee to a summer's day. Thou art my lovely, you're more temporary. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of me. And summer's leaves have all too short a day. Sometimes too hot, I have heaven shines. And often is his gold complexion dim. And every fair from fair, sometimes declines. My chance or nature change the course untrimmed. But that eternal summer shall not fade. Nor lose possession of the fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag, thou wonder is in a shade. When in eternal lines the time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see. So long lives this, and this gives life to thee. As men can breathe, and eyes can see. So long lives this, and this gives life to thee. What I'd like you all to do is just put your hand on your heart a second. Now, if you feel your heart, hopefully your heart should be beaten in sets of two. One off, one on, a D-dum or an I-am as we call it. If it isn't, I do suggest you consult a doctor as soon as possible. But because of that, you can take your hands off your hearts now. But because of that, that's why this rhythm is so intrinsic. You know, we, we're really, music is imitating the, the rhythm of life, the sounds of life the heartbeat of life, and, and so this rhythm, iambic pentameter, even though being such a simple rhythm, is intrinsic to so many forms of music. Other places in the world, they have different sorts of rhythms, like the West African rhythm, it's on the three, people speak in, in triplets, essentially. But we found that this rhythm really acts as a mnemonic device for young people to remember the lyrics, but also really as a, as a, as a way to understand some of what is being said. The rhythm helps us understand it, it helps us communicate feeling, and of course in hip-hop, Tonality, the way you say what you're saying, the mood with which what you're saying, the rhythm with which what you're saying, is as important as what you're actually saying. But revisiting the philosophies and the perceptions or conceptions of these two art forms, these two things we think we know so much about, we'll start with Shakespeare. Over the course of the past three or four years, having worked with hundreds, thousands of young people now, you know, hundreds of workshops, we found out some very interesting uh, things about people's perception of Shakespeare, who they think he was, what the inherited beliefs of the times in which he lived, uh, the people he was surrounded by, his background are. Some of them are, of course, just as with hip-hop, complete nonsense. This idea, for example, that Shakespeare spoke, as people say to us, posh, or the Queen's English, received pronunciation. Well, received pronunciation we know wasn't invented till well after 100 years after Shakespeare died. He'd never heard what we think of today as the Queen's English. When he was alive, people spoke a bit more like a mix between people from Yorkshire and Cornwall. So, for example, the word hours was pronounced urs, urs and urs and urs. Or mood and blood rhyme. Mood and blood was the way in which people would have pronounced those words. You know, the times in which he lived, you know, the chasm between rich and poor being larger than it is today, though we seem to be doing our best to, you know, recreate that chasm. But, you know, he was living in very tumultuous, very violent times, and we really received almost a sanitized vision of that violence, you know, coloring our view of the past. We know over 90% of Shakespeare's audience couldn't read or write. So how is it that in the 21st century, in Britain, that he's come to be viewed as, you know, almost the poster child for elitism? And, and even within that now, we're getting a debate, did he even write his own plays? Because, of course, this comes down to 
Who's allowed to be the custodian of knowledge and who isn't? Shakespeare is someone who didn't go to Eton, who wasn't Oxbridge, is seen by some, who need to see him that way, as someone who's not entitled to be the custodian of knowledge. So we have to find an explanation for his intelligence rather than just accept his intelligence as an actual fact. Which brings me on to hip-hop. Many people have opinions of hip-hop. Of course, the media's had some very loud opinions of hip-hop. But I've found, again, over these working with thousands of people and these hundreds of workshops and interactions with these institutions, many people that have an opinion of hip-hop know absolutely nothing about it. Zero. Zip. What do I mean by that? So the very word hip-hop, the hip in that phrase, comes from the Wolof verb hippie. Wolof is a Senegalese language. It means to open one's eyes and see. It is a term of enlightenment. The word hop from the English signifying movement, thus hip-hop means intelligent movement. Hip-hop contains five elements as codified by its founding fathers in New York City. It contains five elements. DJing, MCing, breakdancing, graffiti art, and the fifth element, which is the one I want to talk about today, knowledge. An element we don't see so much on the television or the radio, perhaps, but of course, the representations of that culture today are not owned by the people who founded that culture. But when it's understood that if we go back to the medieval West African empires of Mali, Songhai, Gao, ancient Ghana, you have a character that the Malians refer to as a griot. These griots still exist today. Well, who was the griot? The griot was a rhythmic, oral poet, singer, musician, custodian of the history, of the spiritual traditions, etc., 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 of those empires, of that culture. When we start to understand how those musical, oral, cultural traditions manifested in many complex ways in the Americas and help influence jazz, blues, funk, up to hip-hop, we get a much greater sense of what the founding fathers, as I said, Africa Bambata, called DJ Herc and Grandmaster Flash, were trying to do when they codified this culture in this way. And understood in that context, of course, hip-hop becomes a very different proposition to the way in which, in much of the time, it is being represented. When we understand what was going on in New York City in the late 70s, early 80s, people coming out of a post-civil rights era, aesthetic, influenced by the literature of Amiri Bakr, you know, or James Baldwin, influenced by the persona of a Muhammad Ali, influenced by the funk of a James Brown. James Brown's drummer, incidentally, is the most sampled drummer in history. His famous loop becomes the basis of all hip-hop music. And that is the only intellectually honest context in which to place hip-hop as a culture. And that's kind of what I grew up in. That's what I was massively influenced by. And it became really, up until the mid-90s, it was still normal for the most commercially successful rappers to boast about how clever they were, to talk about kicking science, dropping knowledge, spreading mathematics, while simultaneously talking about what life was like in the projects of New York City. There was no contradiction between both of those elements. And again, it was about who was custodians of the knowledge, who was choosing to pick up that baton and run with it. And, and one of the things that was so inspirational about hip hop was that people who were told they were not supposed to do that, without trying to be anything they weren't, without dressing any different, without speaking any differently, they decided and made a decision, we're going to become custodians of this knowledge. We're going to educate ourselves and we're going to transmit this knowledge through the music. The main exponents of that in my life, main influence on me, was this group I was telling you about, the Wu-Tang Clan. When Wu-Tang Forever came out, when I was in school, it was the first album that united people that listened to all different sorts of music. You know, up to then, hip-hop still in, in, in London really only appealed to a particular segment of the people in my school anyway. And then Wu-Tang Forever came out, and all of a sudden, kids who listened to heavy metal, kids who were into Blur and Oasis, everybody was united around this one sort of album. And what was it about? It was this openly proud, intelligent discourse that was so undeniable that really appealed, in my opinion, and pulled everybody in. And I'm going to share with you an example of a poem, what I would call a poem, but some people would call it a rap, by the lead member of this group, a gentleman known as The Rizzo. I spoke about earlier, he actually produced the music for the film Kill Bill as well, so some people may know him better in that capacity. But it's a poem he wrote called Twelve Jewels, and this will give you just a sense, as someone, as I said, who was one of the most successful MCs of his time, how normal it was to be so boastful about one's intellect. It's a piece called Twelve Jewels, you can look it up on the internet, I'm only going to share a little bit of it. But it goes like this, Rizzo. In the pre-existence of the mathematical biochemical equations, the manifestations of rock, plant, air, fire and water without their basic formations, solids, liquids, and gases that cause the land masses and the space catalysts and all matter that exists and is dense. Third dimensions must observe a physical comprehension. It takes a nerve to be struck. Wisdom is the wise pursuing to wake up, the dumb who've been sleeping. The fourth dimension is time. 
It goes inside the mind when the chakras energize up through the back of your spine. So observe as my chi energy strikes your vital nerve when swerve of the tongue pierces like a sword through the lung. Have you not heard that words kill as fast as bullets when you load negative thoughts from the chamber of your brain and your mouth pulls the trigger that propels wickedness straight from hell, from the pits of your stomach where negativity dwells? That's just a little piece of the Rizzo's 12 Jewels. But it's, it's interesting because when you, when you understand that kind of lyricism, you realize that hip-hop carries that same power as with Shakespeare. You know, to transmute philosophy, as with any great art, to question the world around us. And this brings us really to the conclusion about what the work we do with the Hip Hop Shakespeare Company, from theatre productions to education productions to hopefully film and TV, which we're working on at the moment. What it's all about is about who's going to be custodians of knowledge. And in the 21st century, particularly moving towards post industrial societies where we don't need masses of workers, we're not training masses of workers to go and work in factories anymore. These are big questions. What is the purpose of education today? What are we teaching young people? What are we training the next generation to do and for? Are we training each individual human being in a society where increasingly the success or failure of a society is going to be dependent on the mind, the ideas of the people within that society? Are we training people to aspire to be the best they can be, to reach their full potential wherever they're born in that society? Or are we still working in the old stratified ways of thinking that people have stations and places they need to be, or encouraging people to think as big as possible. Because maybe I don't know who in Shakespeare's life encouraged him to become a custodian of the knowledge, but if he was not able to do that, we'd be missing this section of work, similarly with hip-hop. So really, that's what we want to think about. Education, who does it belong to, who doesn't it belong to, and using these two seemingly disparate art forms, these two seemingly disparate worlds, and pulling them together to show, I suppose, a unity in, in human culture, a, a, unity, a unity in the ideas that humans pursue, in the activities humans pursue, and to inspire people towards their own forms of artistic, literary, cultural, and societal excellence. I'm going to share with you a little bit of one final piece. It's a bit more, um, I don't want to say fun, but a bit more, a bit more, uh, a bit more of a game and a challenge. It came out of a, a, a radio freestyle. I was on Radio One Extra about two and a half, three years ago. And as a bit of a joke, the DJ said to me, here's a list of 27 Shakespeare plays attempt to fit them in a freestyle. Luckily, we, we did it. I don't know how. We had about 10 minutes, though. So it wasn't a true freestyle in the truest sense. But um, we did it. It's a track that we then subsequently put on the album. So the first part contains 27 Shakespeare plays. The next part contains 16 of Shakespeare's most famous quotes interwoven. It's entitled Comedy, Tragedy, History. You can look it up on the web. And it goes like this. I'm just going to do it here. So it goes. That were your call as a diamond fellow. All you little boys have a comedy of errors. You bellow, but you fellows get played like the cello. I'm doing my thing, you're jealous like a fellow. Who you? What you gonna do? Little boys get tame like the shrew. You midsummer dreaming, your tunes ain't appealing. I'm Capulet, you're Montague, I ain't feeling. I am the Julius Caesar, hear me. The merchant of Venice couldn't sell your CD. As for me, all's well that ends well. Your boys like Macbeth, you're, you're going to hell. Measure for measure, I'm the best here. Your merry wives of Windsor, not King Lear. I don't know about Timon, I know he was in Athens. I'm back like Hamlet, you pay for your actions. That with your car, like, I do it as you like it. You much ado about nothing you do is bite it. I'm too tired, I don't need 12 nights. All your little tempers get murked on the mic, of course. I am the one with the force, your history just like Henry IV. I'm fire, things look dire. Better run like Pericles, Prince of Tyre. Off the scale, cold as a winter's tale. Titus Andronicus was bound to fail. That's 27 plays. <laughs> Listen up. <laughs> and there is one final bit. This contains 16 of Shakespeare's most famous quotes. Wise is the man that knows he's a fool. Tempt not a desperate man with a jewel. Why take from Peter to go and pay Paul some rise by sin and by virtue fool? What have you made if you gain the whole world? But sell your own soul for the price of a pearl. The world is more oyster. And I am starving. I want much more than a penny or a farthing. Told no joke. I hope you're not laughing. Poet or pauper. Which do you class him? Speak eloquent the way I'm resident to the gritty in the city. Surely irrelevant. Call it urban. Call it street. A rose by any other name smell just as sweet. Spit so hard but smart as the bard come through with a union jack full of yard. A carla, a carla. Where for out thou? Rap Shakespeare in the secrets out now. Chance never did crown me. This is destiny. You still talk, but it still perplexes me. Devour cowards, thousands per hour. Don't you know the king's name is a tower? You should never speak it. It is not a secret. I teach theses like ancient Greece's or Egyptology. Never no apology. In my mind's eye, I see things properly. Stopping me? Nah. You can never possibly. I bear a charm with life, most probably for certain. I speak daggers in a phrase. I'll put an end to your dancing. Days, no matter what you say. Hit will never work. Men's can't make prey where eagles won't perch. Worse with the words, because I curse all my verbs on the first with a verse to rehearse with a nurse. Hearse with the first jerk who turned berserk. Off with his head, because it must not work. Work, ramp with a carla, 
true madness. And there's no method in it, just sadness. I speak with the daggers and the hammers of a passion when I'm rapping an attack. I'm in a military fashion. Pattern, I'm a rapping chat and cutting them pet. And I run more rings round things than satin. Sick, never slacking like a pig with a baton versus split big kids' wigs when I'm rapping. That what you call it, a rap Shakespeare. Didn't want to listen when I said last year. Rich as a gem in Ethiop's ear. Tell them all again for them we never hear. It's a pleasure.